Welcome to our webinar today on Empowering Indigenous Voices and Impact Assessment. My name is Bridget John and I will be moderating today's webinar. I work for the International Association for Impact Assessment, or IAIA, and we are the leading global network on best practice in the use of impact assessment for informed decision making. Today's presentation is on um, empowering Indigenous Voices and Impact Assessment, and it's part of a series that IAIA recently started. Uh, and so I invite you to take a look at the webinars that we already have done. And our next one will take place in early February. It will be presented by Liz Green, who is an IAIA member, and it will be on health and gender impacts in a nighttime economy. And before we jump into today's topic, I just have a few items of housekeeping for you. It's a 90-minute webinar, and we will be recording it. We will make the recording and the slides available to you online after. You will receive a link, an email, within the next day or two so that you'll get access to those. Uh, we will be accepting questions, and, and our presenters will be answering those at the last 15 minutes. And But please feel free to ask questions at any time in the questions pane of your uh, control panel. So enter those all the way throughout the, the webinar and we'll take those at the very end. You'll also see in the handout section of your control panel that there are a few handouts in addition to the slides. There is a journal article by our presenters today as well as the ASHACON declaration which they'll be referencing and a couple uh, publications by IAIA which uh, are related to Indigenous Peoples and Impact Assessment. Our first presenter today is Dr. Keppa Morgan. Keppa is Indigenous, a Fellow of the Institution of Professional Engineers, General Manager of Nyati Makino Iwi Tribal Authority, and Chair of the Indigenous Peoples Section of IAIA. During his career, Keppa has held roles including engineer, chief executive and associate dean, and has co-created engineering solutions with indigenous communities of the Pacific. Keppa will be addressing the Maori model of decision-making framework today. Our second presenter is Tumanako Faui. Tumanako is a doctoral candidate at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. His thesis examines the impact of the 2011 grounding of the MV Rena container ship in the Bay of Plenty, New Zealand. And that's what we'll be hearing from him about today. So with that, I will turn it over to Keppa to get us started. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, tēnā koutou from Aotearoa, New Zealand. And uh, welcome to our webinar in part one in which I will introduce the Modi Model Decision-Making Framework. Um, <clears throat> so by way of introduction, uh, my community uh, needed a local, uh, locally relevant decision-making framework in 2003, so about um, 14, 15 years ago, and that was needed to respond to the deterioration of our freshwater lakes, which we had little influence over. The decision makers uh, focus uh, on money was a problem due to the time frames over which the negative impacts were being experienced. So <clears throat> that's uh, just a, as an intro of where this has come from, but in terms of how it's relevant to you, uh, there was a recent survey of our membership and that was um, Part of that was in understanding the non-technical skills that we wanted uh, to improve on. So these skills can be enhanced, um, the ones listed on the slide that is, uh, through using the Modi Model Decision Making Framework. And these skills also comprise the majority of non-technical skills that were identified uh, in the survey. So if you're interested in the relevance of the Modi Model Decision Making Framework to any of these particular skills listed, then I think the opportunity to discuss that will come in question time. Okay, so getting in, cutting to the chase. Uh, impact assessments can involve complex situations with competing outcomes that result in benefits for some and consequences for others. 
often the time frames that these benefits and consequences are experienced uh, vary and they're not in, um, in tune with each other. As well, the consequences are not well understood, particularly from the perspective of the Indigenous peoples being impacted. So the first thing I want to say is that different ways of knowing do exist. There was uh, some prompt questions. Um, indigenous peoples in particular have ways of knowing that are tied to physical place and often the names for the place and the people are the same. So how do we model reality in a way that is consistent with the indigenous way of belonging and knowing to a particular place if we're in a role doing an impact assessment for that uh, location? Uh, that's a question that we'll hopefully understand the answer to by the end of the presentation. And um, I think to bring it home to myself, it was evident from my ancestors' um, actions that Modi, this concept of Modi, the life supporting capacity, was the basis of that understanding, that way of knowing, and impacts on Modi. Uh, were really the crux uh, of, of issues that determined what actions were necessary and um, in terms of also understanding the uh, implications of taking certain decisions. So to know using Modi in a science-dominated world requires a way of acknowledging bias and taking advantage of it. If we seek to dominate the scientific worldview with an indigenous worldview, that will end up being a contest of worldviews, and I don't think it would be that productive in terms of a good outcome. So the, um, the real trick is to be able to draw on both uh, worldviews and both knowledge systems to get the most complete understanding of the problem that you're facing. So this is the Modi model representation of reality um, that's used. Now, just before I go to that, um, I want to uh, just reinforce that idea of where this concept of Modi uh, and its, um, its relevance has come from. In the uh, early 1980s, our government in New Zealand set up a process to resolve uh, grievances that were being created that were inconsistent with our founding document, the Treaty of Waitangi. The tribunal that was created is called the Waitangi Tribunal. And of the early cases that were brought to the tribunal, the majority related to contemporary offence caused, cultural offence caused to different tribal groups. And uh, a lot of the time it was the impact on food sources that had been available and making those food sources unsuitable for use from a cultural perspective. And those um, environmental um, issues were taken up with the tribunal. The majority of them were uh, successfully challenged through the tribunal and they resulted in a lot of changes to engineering projects as you can see on the slide that's currently up. Now, the underpinning conceptual approach for these challenges was the impact upon Modi. And this isn't a concept that's um, widely known within English-speaking cultures. Uh, but if you like, Modi is the capacity or the life-supporting capacity of anything or anyone or any group of those things. So it could be the life-supporting capacity of water, uh, the life supporting capacity of a person, uh, a group of people, a community, or even the life supporting capacity of an ecosystem. And because it's so universal, uh, we believe that even rocks contribute in some way to life supporting capacity. Um, Mother Earth being an example of that on a very large scale. The, because of the universal, universality of that concept of Modi, it can be used to measure anything. 
Um, here's a slide. Uh, images speak a thousand words apparently, and in those three pictures that you can see, uh, the Modi is evident, and um, you'll perceive what you perceive from those images. For, for myself, those are my two children, two youngest children and our dog, um, and those environments that are shown there are environments that I consider to be my ecosystems of origin. So the Modi in those places and those, those uh, people uh, is strong. And if you want to understand Modi in a scientific context, you could think of it similarly to gravity as an attractive force. Uh, in this case, it's the attractive force between the physical and everything else that facilitates life and facilitates all life. Okay, so Modi was relevant in the Waitangi Tribunal cases. Um, it continues to be, but it's also relevant in New Zealand in uh, a lot of wider um, agendas. And in Auckland, we have a, um, I, th I think it might be a well-known um, marine gulf called the Hodaki Gulf and uh, processes around managing that and protecting its value have been uh, in place for probably a decade and a half. Now what's interesting here and, and reinforces what I'm saying about the universality of Modi as a concept is that the majority of uh, goal statements and ways of understanding how to manage the Hodaki Gulf into the future include the word and the concept Modi. And you have some examples there on the screen. Um, as you can see, Modi can be used to understand uh, the actions required in relation to a um, ecosystem and also guide how different um, different stakeholders, different uh, practitioners might engage with that concept. Okay, so the uh, Modi model. Now there's, there's a number of parts that make up this framework, but the first one to understand is the Modi model. And this is a representation of reality that integrates global knowledge and scientific understandings with indigenous knowledge. There are four dimensions of Modi in the Modi model. There's uh, ecosystem, us included. Indigenous place-based identity, which is the cultural context. The community, um, social well-being, if you like. And the family or whānau Modi, the household um, vitality, if you like. And that is um, really where economic well-being is uh, experienced by most people. So these reflect the four well-beings in New Zealand law and our Resource Management Act, being environmental, cultural, social, and economic well-being. The addition, I guess a lot of people, international viewers will be seeing, is an additional well-being called cultural well-being. And that is there to recognise uh, the history of New Zealand and that there were two peoples that formed this nation, the indigenous people, tangata whenua, people of the land, Māori, we're commonly known as, and uh, the settler government, if you like, and combined those two groups have uh, formed the country and the government and uh, the laws that are used attempt to recognise uh, those uh, founding relationships in the Treaty of Waitangi, and to do that one way is to include cultural well-being in um, our reality. So those dimensions are represented on this takarangi, which is the double spiral, and they're done in a way that they're in different font sizes, they might even be different fonts, um, so that it's understood that these take different precedents depending on who you are and your background and your the way you were raised and so on. So some people might prioritise one of these above the others. Others might prioritise alternative 
well-beings or Modi dimensions, depending on who we are and what we stand for. Now, there's no judgment being made around that. Um, it's just what is its fact. Everybody has bias and they prioritize these things in different ways. The opportunity that sits within that, though, is to exploit the bias because that bias will reflect expertise that has been honed in relation to particular dimensions and perhaps less so in relation to others. So if we exploit that bias to best understand the four dimensions, we can potentially have the best um, understanding of the, the, the problem or the challenge that we're facing. So the Modi model is the basis of this decision-making framework, and it does two things. It shows that there's four dimensions of Modi, that they are related to each other, and that different people might see those in a different uh, hierarchy or priority. Now, to determine what that is, we quantify bias of a particular stakeholder, a stakeholder group, um, other parties, maybe the government and so on, by doing a simple peerwise comparison of each Modi dimension against the others. And we use a scale that if there is no difference in priority or importance, um, no difference is zero, that's intuitive, and then the scale works about zero if it's less important, negative numbers, and if it's more important, positive numbers. And through filling out this table and completing the calculation, we can get a hierarchy for a particular worldview that infers the order of importance of the four dimensions, but also their percentage weighting. And that percentage weighting is useful later on when we do a sensitivity analysis of our results and we see if we can modify those results using that worldview bias to represent the situation as it's understood by that worldview. Now, if that's possible for multiple worldviews that actually don't agree with each other, that's the um, verification that the modeling of the situation itself has been done completely and correctly. So I'll leave that one and we'll move on to how the framework operates. So this is the Modi model decision-making framework and you'll see it's a cyclic process uh, we accept subjectively that our ontology or our reality can be described as four Modi dimensions, and that's the Modi model just presented. We then quantify worldview bias in relation to the four dimensions, and where bias is most strongly expressed by a worldview, we would expect that uh, highest priority to also be able to define um, the indicators that best reflect that dimension. Once we have a group of indicators that reflect each of the four dimensions, we can then define the thresholds for those indicators. And those indicators can then be measured and combined within dimensions. And then the dimensions themselves can be uh, combined uh, proportionately depending on worldviews. And measurements can be done over time. They can project, be projected into the future, or they can be backcast into, into our history to understand the trends that are uh, occurring within complex situations, including the sustainability of ecosystems, um, even the sustainability of, of our planet. So that's how the framework works. Uh, to get a better understanding, um, Tuma Knuckles providing a case study next, but I'll just give a little bit more information first. So in terms of uh, this idea of better describing problems, the process is represented here. The goal is to use participant bias to best understand the problem. The cycle shown is iterative and enables community capacity to grow with successive applications of the framework. The process also creates the means for monitoring the impacts of our decisions. And if it's done well, it should actually provide clarity 
not only for the decision makers, but also commitment from everybody that's affected by doing this properly. In terms of the framework's pedigree, um, it, it does have credibility. Uh, even though it's based on indigenous concepts and it attempts to do things that haven't been done perhaps by others, uh, it has been assessed and I'll just share that assessment before going, going ahead. Balagio Stamp are a set of principles, sustainability principles, that were identified by a gathering of experts in Rome in 2009. Uh, they gathered in Balagio and they came up with what they thought would reflect a um, exemplar for a sustainability indicator set. And this was um, done after the Modi model had been created about five years earlier. So of the 11 sustainability indicator sets that were evaluated by a New Zealand research institution called the Cawthorn Research Institute, only three actually um, met and delivered on all of the principles. And the Modi model was found to be the exemplar in that it was considered to be uh, most useful regardless of the community. And that's an important thing as a takeaway is that even though this framework is based on an indigenous concept from New Zealand, the framework itself and its application is considered relevant regardless of the community that is applied in. Now I'll just touch on um, the, um, the caveat on that statement, but if uh, you're interested in knowing how to measure Modi, we'll do that and then I'll come back to the application in different contexts outside New Zealand. So to measure Modi, we adopt an approach that determines impact thresholds. And the first threshold for any indicator is to quantify what no impact is. So for no impact, there will be an upper and a lower threshold that experts will consider represents no impact on that indicator. So population change is an example, um, births and deaths, um, you'll have some percentage of that population uh, in terms of replacements and losses that scientists consider is not a significant change in that population and that would reflect um, no change in the Modi. Now once we've defined what no change is, we then can determine whether the Modi of that indicator is being enhanced, which would be positive, or diminished, which would be negative. And rather than focusing on how much in either regard, all we really need to know, because we're dealing with sustainability over long time frames and very complex interrelations of indicators, is whether the indicator has actually reached its uh, absolute total, either being um, extinct or technically extinct or exhausted or totally depleted, or whether it is um, as fully intact as possible. Uh, the integrity, the potential is as good as it possibly can be. So those are the thresholds we're setting. And here's an example, well sorry, before we get to the example, we'll just touch on the measurements. Uh, so reinforcing what I just said, no change is zero. To the right, to your right, you have enhancing life support and capacity, Modi, and if it's enhancing in that direction but it hasn't arrived at its best possible outcome, it scores plus one, partial change. If it arrives at as good as it possibly can be, it scores plus two. And you'll note that on that side I've got an arrow indicating that's where sustainability lies. To the left of zero change in the, in the Modi of an indicator lies um, a diminishing of its life supporting capacity to the point that it's um, extinct or no longer can provide any life supporting capacity. And the interesting thing is that's where the tipping points lie. Now one caution I would give to everybody watching is that we shouldn't be actually finding out how close we can get to these tipping points. That seems to be the objective in a lot of assessments is we'll, we'll go ahead and see if we can get close to the, um, 
to the uh, tipping point. Now, just a, an example, as I said, marine habitat management for a coastal area that's quite close to where um, the Rena disaster occurred, and we're preparing a marine spatial plan for um, the marine spatial plan. An important indicator that we have is the coverage of the um, the seabed forest, the seaweed, and you can see two images there on your right, a fully restored ecosystem which has everything to support the whole ecosystem um, food chain if you like, and on the left you have what are called kinnabarans. Now this is because predation of the fish, overfishing by commercial operators, removes the predators for these sea urchins or kinna, and then the kinna population is able to increase and consume all of the, the seabed forest, the seaweed, and you end up with these barrens. Now the scientists have been able to tell us that no change in the overall ecosystem modi would be in the extent of uh, barrens existing that occupied 5 to 10 percent of the overall area being um, looked at and that it would be as good as it possibly can be when there are less than 1% kinnabarren and any so with those two um, thresholds we know that we're going to have to behave differently if we're in the plus one space where there's less than 5% kinnabarrens to uh, the uh, situation where we have a constantly diminishing life supporting capacity where the kinnabarrens have exceeded 10% so that's an example. There's a clear difference there. It's very easy to use this as a planning tool, as a management tool for that marine ecosystem. Um, and it gives robust results that will hold because the scientists have determined the extent of those thresholds. So um, this is a fairly um, strong message, I guess. But to conclude my introduction of the Modi model, I think that indigenous ways of knowing continue to be re relevant today. These ways of knowing offer solutions to problems that are facing humanity uh, and that are threatening our future survival. The contribution that indigenous ways of knowing can make are becoming more obvious while society is becoming increasingly concerned about the out of balance emphasis on economic outcomes at the expense of all else. I mentioned I'd show how the worldviews can be used to reinforce an, an understanding. So just before passing over to Tumanakal, this brief example demonstrates the successful application of the Modi model for use in Papua and its application to a common infrastructure solution. So the Agats Township is located in the Asmat Regency. It's a small expat community that exists in a tidal zone and that was to benefit from a potable water supply project. And um, the local government designed and built the water supply that they believe would provide undeniable benefits for that community. However, the indigenous people, the Asmat people, considered that the project was a disaster for their community, even though it provided an alternative to bottled water for agats. So you can see some images there of this community. Uh, the tide comes and goes underneath. And so you can understand getting fresh water um, is a challenge. You can see somebody there with bottles of fresh water, but also disposal is also an issue. So we did the evaluation. Uh, we did the worldview quantification for the two parties that were obviously uh, not agreeing on this uh, project. Local government, you can see, weren't um, dominated by the economic outlook, and neither were the asthma people totally opposed to economic considerations. In fact, they were quite similar. Uh, however, local government placed the most priority on social well-being, uh, being the public health improvements brought by a potable water supply, whereas the asthma people were more con concerned about the um, their cultural identity and the integrity of their ecosystem upon which their cultural identity is dependent. Now what we've done is we've done an evaluation over 25 years of the project and when I click the button you'll see that come up. The blue line is 
the equally weighted understanding when you have the four Modi dimensions combined 25% uh, each and the two coloured lines for local government and ASMAT will reflect their experience of that reality based on their worldview bias. So first we'll put up the local government and because of their stronger uh, prioritisation of the social well-being, you can see the red line clearly demonstrates an improvement in Modi. And on the vertical axis you actually have the Modi pivot of zero as the uh, x-axis and positive Modi being above the x-axis and negative Modi being below. So you can see the combination of Modi dimensions in an equally weighted fashion actually trends slightly negative over the life of the project. The local government perspective is that the, um, the Modi proposition actually increases quite significantly. Now if we apply the bias or worldview sensitivities of the Asmat people, we actually get the polar opposite. Their Modi drops from about the place that the local government understanding of Modi ends and it drops down to pretty much lower than where the local government's understanding of Modi began. So what you have here is a clear demonstration that the Modi model decision-making framework can reflect differing worldviews accurately, but more importantly that in this case the project resulted in a transfer of wealth or Modi from one group to another. And that's an injustice that's been recognised by the local government of Asmat uh, and those uh, of Agats. And the local government have now gone back to the project and they're looking at how they can address those um, injustices that were created through the project. So that's uh, as far as I'm going to go. Thank you for your attention. I'm now handing over to Tumanako and um, his example, which is the Rena disaster, Tina Koto, Tina Koto, Tina Koto Katoa. Sorry. No, we're good, we're good. Okay, if you can just uh, pause your screen, Kipper, and mute your screen, please. Right, just... Uh... Okay, kia ora tato ko tumunako whaawi tōku ingoa. He uri tēne no te aroa waka. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tumunako whaawi. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Auckland and um, what I'm going to talk about today is building on what Kipper's first part uh, was talking about is was the Modi model. So what I am doing is uh, presenting an application of this framework and how we have used the Modi model within this particular context to empower the indigenous peoples or the local people in this area within their decision making context or within the impact assessment context. Okay, so just a little bit of background about the disaster itself. Uh, in 2011, the merchant vessel Rena was en route from Napier in the South Island in New Zealand. So New Zealand has two islands. From the bottom island, the container vessel was making its way to the port of Tauranga in the Bay of Plenty of New Zealand and ran aground a reef called Ashley Reef or in its traditional name Otaiti. Uh, this disaster is considered to be New Zealand's worst environmental maritime disaster uh, and that's because it spilled around 350 tonnes of heavy fuel oil. Uh, it was laden with containers, uh, much of which went overboard and were and, and had potentially um, 
dangerous contaminants uh, on board. There was cryolite, which is a, a byproduct of the aluminium smelting process. Uh, copper clove, uh, which was just the copper from the Christchurch earthquakes that was being transported for recycling, uh, as well as the anti-fouling found in the paint that was being chipped off as the reef as the ship was on the reef. Um, and this disaster has been considered as uh, one of the most expensive wreck recovery operations uh, in the world to date, currently costing uh, upwards of 500 million New Zealand dollars. Uh, and as a result of the disaster, a three mile uh, nautical exclusion zone was set up. Okay, so within this context, uh, we have a highly complex situation. You could probably or could easily fall into the category of a uh, of a uh, wicked problem. You have a whole lot of things complicating everything. So at the reef itself, it was a high energy environment, which made uh, recovery at the start very difficult, and it was a very close proximity, around 27 kilometres from the nearest shoreline and around seven kilometers from the nearest inhabited island. So it wasn't somewhere far off out in the sea. It was pretty much in just in the backyard or in the uh, back ocean of a whole lot of people in the area. Now, as you can as you can see, there was a lot of oil that was being it was spilt and which ended up on the shorelines. So as a result of the disaster, the environmental effects were the most immediately noticeable. Uh, containers and oil was were being washed ashore. Uh, people were, were taking it upon themselves to try and deal with the oil and the mess that was essentially washing up on their beaches. Now that was because this disaster was uh, an orders of magnitude than anything that had ever been planned uh, for within our, our oil spill uh, management strategy from Maritime New Zealand. And because of that, uh, communication lines were blurred uh, and it, it took some time for the official recovery or the official response to get into action. Now, yes, these environmental effects were the most immediate, immediately noticeable, uh, but on the back of these, as I'm sure a lot of you can probably appreciate, there was a whole slew and a whole suite of ongoing or related impacts that weren't necessarily environmental. They may have been environmental in origin, uh, but they weren't necessarily environmental and therefore weren't getting a lot of attention or weren't noticeable immediately. So these are things like the economic effects, so the effects on local businesses, on the local uh, People who relied on these waters and these these areas to run to run their businesses or to run their livelihoods, and even people that relied on these waters or these areas to gather resources for sustenance. So these were uh, like some of the local islanders nearby and some of the local indigenous peoples also. And with that, also we have these social effects, social impacts, as you can see here. People of the area have a very close tie to these waters and to these beaches, which is probably what drove them, drove them and drove a whole lot of people to, en masse, head down to the beaches, uh, grab a spade, grab a shovel, and start trying to clean up this oil. People did that without uh, training and without any protective gear or briefing on how you should actually do that. But like, that goes to show the kind of connection and the social, I guess, vibe or identity of the local people, not necessarily indigenous. But the key complicating factor that I would consider having looked at this disaster is the presence of the cultural factors or the indigenous peoples within this area. So we have some more photos. So being at that this disaster has occurred in New Zealand, uh, extra care or extra an extra layer of complexity are the presence of the indigenous peoples. So within this area of the Bay of Plenty or in the Tauranga Moana area, it's uh, not as simple as geographically lined or boundaries in terms of 
where the people are. So there are several different tribal groups and sub-tribal groups that are, have genealogical links to this area. And they all have their own stories and cultures and traditions tied not only to these waters, to these different sites, but to the area as a whole and to each other. So in, in this picture you can see uh, uh, this recovery was actually in this area, I think it's um, near Maketu, was actually driven by the local people and the indigenous peoples or the these communi indigenous community centers actually became hubs for the recovery. Uh, housing people, feeding people and actually pushing for the recovery when the official channels weren't there. And this goes you know, a little bit further than just having an affinity to the area. It's a bit more spiritual. So the cultural and spiritual connections that are present here uh, aren't easily identified or quantified within uh, standard means, I guess you could say, often because they're metaphysical. These are things uh, like cultural responsibilities, uh, spiritual connections to place, uh, spiritual connections to ancestors, uh, and these are the types of things that uh, have driven and are still driving a lot of the indigenous communities or the tribal groups within this area uh, to to continue the fight or to continue, I guess, trying to um, you know peel go a bit deeper regarding this disaster or regarding this context. So. Just a little bit, of, just to give you a little bit of background about what exactly this disaster has meant uh, for some of the indigenous groups. The reef that the Rena actually ran aground is a very sacred reef to a lot of different groups, and there are a lot of different stories, narratives, uh, rituals, and customs that are tied to this particular reef. Um, uh, so this reef has, has so much importance that in the second quote here, it, give, it provides some, you know, context about what's happened. It's it's akin to someone going to your mother's grave, and you know, chucking rubbish on it. But even that, I don't think comes close to you know, some of the feelings that we've seen. And even if you were even if you were inclined to not maybe believe that, practically you would be surely able to appreciate that. Yes, these waters were teeming with you know life and fish and other resources that these people use and as a, as a result of the disaster they're no longer able to um, to harvest or to utilize these materials or resources so the con the cultural context here is a definitely a complicating factor and adds a layer of complexity that is not always seen in other impact assessment uh, scenarios and has definitely uh, been a challenge within the official uh, assessment of the impacts and especially within our research also. And so with that and looking at this disaster and, and seeing this particular context kind of forming at the start, it was clear to us that working with Māori communities, not on, but with Māori communities, should be a key concern and key aim for our research. And so to do that, it required a research methodology that was indigenous-based that would allow us to um, follow our traditions, to embed our tikanga or in the way in which we do things uh, within our, our data collection, the way we uh, contact and meet with people. So what we decided to go with was a kaupapa Māori research methodology. Uh, kaupapa essentially just means purpose and Māori are the people, indigenous people of New Zealand, so a Māori-centric research methodology. Uh, Kathy Irwin defines it quite well, I think, a research which is culturally safe, which involves a mentorship of kaumātua, which is culturally relevant and appropriate while satisfying the rigor of research and we're just, and which is undertaken by a Māori researcher, not a researcher who happens to be Māori. So I think this last part is really important for our context because Kepa and I, uh, we both have 
our whakapapa or these genealogical links to the areas itself. So that has made it a little bit easier to make contact and to um, start these conversations because we are, we are already familiar um, with the context, uh, with the, the tikanga or the way in which things are done. And that has allowed us to uh, start these conversations where we can then go about accurately representing uh, and including the different values and views of these communities. Okay, and summed up even more uh, succinctly by Linda Smith, research by Māori, for Māori, and with Māori. And I think we're ticking all three of those boxes, so we can move on. Okay, jumping back to the disaster, uh, in the year following the grounding, uh, New Zealand's Ministry for the Environment released the RENA Long-Term Environmental Recovery Plan. Uh, this plan outlined the different potential strategies that were being proposed for recovery, the goals, the different objectives, and just a, a timeline, uh, a proposed timeline for recovery. Now what's really significant about this plan is that it has the goal to restore the modi of the infected of the affected environment to its pre rena state. Now if you remember that word modi, hopefully you, you would keep it said it about a thousand times. So that's the key part of our presentation here. If you remember one thing, you remember what Modi is, please. So um, this goal statement, uh, it frames the whole recovery in terms of this concept of Modi. Now that's significant because it recognizes and acknowledges the presence of these metaphysical characteristics. It acknowledges the importance and aspirations of the indigenous peoples. And that it, it identifies that there are factors present that are not purely physical and not purely surface. So essentially this goal statement has become the research question of, of my thesis. How do I go about, or how do we go about restoring the modi of the affected environment to its pre state? state? Uh, so in looking at tools and looking at the potential ways in which we can uh, restore the modi of the affected environment to its pre-rena state, it was clear that an assessment of the impacts of the disaster was was required. And looking at the different tools, the modi model essentially well, it ticked all the boxes and provided a, a clear pathway, a clear framework in which to start these conversations and to achieve the goals in which we wanted to of ensuring that there was uh, Maori community participation and that the voices of the indigenous community were being heard. And going back to what Kipper said, it's not about lifting up indigenous knowledge or Maori knowledge up above our Western science or scientific knowledge. It's just about providing an even platform so that we can also be considered or have our values and our stories heard on a on a on an equal or uh, or a level on a level platform. Not not trying to turn it into a fight in terms of who's better, but uh, taking the approach that uh, providing and including all uh, relevant and available information is a much better approach rather than trying to say one is better than the other. So the Modi model was chosen because yes, it allows us to include these scientific metrics being that were you know, being looked at. Uh, by the by the by the owners by the other universities and yes we are also able to include the stories the narratives you know the the knowledge of the local people regarding the area into our assessment and with that it allowed you know a direct collaboration and of of knowledge systems between not only the indigenous peoples but then again the owners the the different stakeholders uh, and Break, it was able to, you know, break down the the barriers and start to start some of these difficult conversations that, you know, may not have had an impetus otherwise. Um, and with that, we are able to uh, allow people a space to recognise that there are other ways of viewing the world, um, even for Maori, because I guess on both sides of the coin, you could probably say that. 
uh, Maori communities may often have an inherent distrust of anyone seen as being a colonial or kind of a scientist. Uh, not always the case, but as, as often. And that goes the same on the other side of the coin. So scientists or practitioners, not always, but you know, will often you know, not appreciate or not give any credence to traditional knowledge. Uh, and so what the Modi model does, or what the framework allows us to do, is to you know, break down these barriers and start these conversations and you know, open up uh, these really narrow worldviews to consider that yes, there are particular other ways of looking at the world, and it's not a decision of whether one or the other. We can have both, or we can have all. Okay, so how did we go about doing that? What did that look like practically? So remember, everything was run under this methodology of kaupapa Māori. So all our meetings were, were uh, done according to tikanga or according to the traditional ways in which uh, of the, the traditional ways of the local people, but we had a you know a very strong working relationship with the with the indigenous groups that we had worked with, um, and this was wasn't one where it was us dictating everything. It was a you know a true equal relationship where a lot of the work you know was was really driven by by Te Aroa Kitai, by the group who we, who we were working with. Um, and with that, you, you can see that the communities have a sense of ownership of the research. It's not, and they're actually getting something tangible out of it rather than giving, 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 and then you get a sent a paper, you know, a couple months, uh, maybe a year later. No, no, they're actually being able to contribute actively to the, um, to the process. Uh, and that was, you know, it seems to be really valuable. And I think that sentiment comes out here in this quote from one of the participants. Uh, there was an immediate connection and understanding of the Modi model that accurately and appropriately expresses cultural values in a way that scientists can understand and vice versa. So the story it tells is a story grown from the Tangata Whenua experiences and it can be expressed in a way that everyone understands. That last bit is a really important uh, part I see from our work with the Modi model, it can be expressed in a way that everyone understands. A lot of the time, yes, the, the different tools or methodologies we use are completely foreign to the people who, who we are using them with or who or with these communities we are trying to communicate with. And when that happens, it's, it's difficult to have active participation. But if we can present our work or present you know, our yeah, impact assessment in a way that is, you know, very simple, but yet is able to adequately represent these impacts, but and is also understandable to the people. Uh, it, it seems, and as it's shown here, that we can get you know better buy-in and more relevance, not only for our research but for the communities themselves. Another quote. Okay, what I most, what I was most impressed with was how the process ensures a meaningful link between the researchers and Ahikaroa. That convergence between the academics and those at the grassroots is important for gaining a better understanding of what the community is experiencing and the capacity of the community is actually increased also. So that goes towards, again, what we were talking about. Um, the not You don't have to choose you know, between Western science or traditional knowledge. We can have both. And that is what the title of the slide is, Exploring the Interface, what Sir Mason Jury uh, termed. So the interface being the interface between science and the interface between the Māori world or Māori knowledge. So oftentimes we're stuck either all the way over here or all the way over here. Whereas, you know, why don't we come at the interface or even yet, why don't we break down the interface and open a bridge between the two between the two knowledge systems and two worldviews, which is what I think we have been able to do with the use of the Modi model in this context. Okay, that's just more of that. So on the left side we have some of the factors from the non-Maori worldview regarding the arena disaster, and on the right side uh, the Maori worldview with these similarities in the middle. So essentially this is a representation of the start 
Okay, as this has gone on, as the process of using the Modi model with the communities, we're able to get an appreciation of the left side, and the left side is able to get an appreciation of the right side also. So what the hope is, and I guess what it should be, is that this Venn diagram should hopefully you know, get closer and closer and closer together where they have these more similarities, or, or better yet, it don't necessarily need to have similarities as long as there's an understanding of how the other side views the world and how the other side uh, views knowledge, knowledge transmission, uh, then that is more valuable than uh, just a one singular on its own. So working with these communities, the next part uh, in trying to, in looking at the, in assessing the impacts of the arena disaster was to compile these sets of indicators that would then be measured using the Modi meter that Kepa talked about. Yeah? So if you, just a quick recap, within the Modi model there are four dimensions. So we have the three usual dimensions. We have environmental, social, and economic. And then we have the fourth being the cultural dimension. So these are the uh, indicators for the cultural dimension. Just breeze through these. These are the environmental well-being or the modi of the ecosystem dimensions. These are the economic dimensions. These are the social dimensions. So I will say that all of these dimensions, it took a, a very long time to compile these uh, dimension, these indicators. We would collect information. We would talk to the different stakeholders. We'd talk to iwi. Um, get the input, you know, put together an initial list and a description. Does this fit your representation? Maybe not, we'll take it back. So it was a very iterative and open process and it took a while to arrive at these indicators. So then what we do, similar to the asthma example, um, our first step in answering this question, how do we restore the modi of the affected environment to its pre state? So the first part of that is to identify, okay, what exactly is this pre arena state? Uh, how do we identify this baseline? So that baseline was identified all the way here in 2011, but to, we didn't feel that looking just prior to the disaster was a, was an accurate or a, a good way to approach our pre arena assessment. So we conducted a 100-year retrospective analysis of the arena-affected environment, where we measured impacts upon Modi using those defined those uh, defined indicators, um, measuring the impacts of, across the, f the four different dimensions, uh, and with the black line being the overall or the amalgamated across the four dimensions, the overall impact upon Modi. Now the reason why we did that was because there was an inherent assumption within that goal statement that the pre arena state was the best state to be in. Now, if, I'm not sure about how things are done in other places, but within the Maori context, you wouldn't just aim to be at a place that was kind of like just okay or mm. the aim should be to be enhancing up, up and over it. So, what the goal was here was you see, okay, what was the environment like before that? Was it at a time where it was much better? And as we can see, you know, there were a lot of times when it was much better. And another thing to notice was that within the, all of this, the cultural dimension was uh, seen to be the most laggy a lot of the time. Uh, there's a lot of other underlying attributes that I won't go into at the moment. Okay, the next step of our assessment of the impacts was to take this pre arena state, which is shown by this black dotted line here, as plus 0 0.48, and then compare that against the impacts um, from the disaster, so from October 2011 to October 2014. So we assessed the impacts in three month intervals across a four year period. Now, as you can see, all of the, in, all of the dimensions are tracking upwards quite nicely. Uh, however, the cultural dimension um, is the most negative over the time, and that's a representative. Uh, that's representative of a lot of the impacts, these cultural effects that 
may not have been noticeable on the surface unless you were the, unless you knew or were an indigenous people or, or were one of the indigenous groups within the area. And the other thing you might see, so the black line again is the overall impact upon Rody. Looking at this at a glance, you may, may be tempted to think, hold on, okay, in, in 2015, you know, we hit our goals, we hit our pre arena set. So you're not, pack it up, guys, we're done. Uh, we've, we've reached our goal. But, okay, there's, there's, one thing, there's one thing that's wrong with that. Yes, you have reached the goal, but there was a whole lot of time spent negative or below the pre arena state. They must be accounted for. So these are the cumulative effects. Now, if we go back to the previous slide, uh, there was a whole time spent a positive or above what you consider or above the zero. So these areas can be considered as you know the ecosystem's resilience and resilience to change uh, or you know inertia to change. So. The time that was spent negative has, has eroded at the ecosystem's you know, ability to bounce back. That we've, that's what we've noted here. And so in order for true recovery to the pre arena state, that whole area under here um, must be accounted for. Okay, so got a couple wrapping up slides. Within our research, uh, especially in this context of the arena disaster, the uh, participation of the community it was was valuable on on all fronts. It was very it was valuable for for the research. It provided a better picture of the disaster and of the of the impacts, and also for the community, which it is just as much about, with especially utilizing a capable Maori research methodology. It increased their you know increased community capacity. It allowed. It allows allows community a a framework or a way to start these discussions um, with council with the owners, and it allows uh, a wide wider inclusion within the decision making. So the decision making is taking out of the hands of a few and put into the hands of many. Uh, and again, if a question I remember from I I two thousand seventeen, you know what what. How do we go about doing you know, impact assessment with indigenous communities? You know, people say, you know, I try really hard, you know, and I do get that. And if, if we're looking for a silver bullet, um, please let me know. I'd love to find it myself. But I think the, the key message here is that you know, the community has changed from, from place to place, and there's, no, there's not going to be any one way that works for everyone. But I do think that this Modi model decision-making framework that we've used here uh, provides a really good starting point uh, to having these conversations with indigenous communities, or a, a way in which you can, that you can, you know, you can frame these the impact assessment within a within a way, and that everyone understands. So, uh, and that was that came through the Cawthorn report that Kepa shared, also. Okay, really, really last thing. Uh, earlier this year, prior to the 2017 IAIA conference, the Indigenous People Section held the um, held Ashigan, which was a cultural exchange between um, Indigenous peoples from around the world that have had experience either as uh, have had experience with um, impact assessment, and there was a uh, really magical three days, uh, really powerful, learnt a whole lot. And at the end of the of the exchange, uh, we, the delegation, the Indigenous people delegation of that workshop, uh, put together the Ashigan Declaration, which is attached in your resources, I believe. So if you ha if you haven't read it, I, I would please um, urge you to have a look at it. It's a set of guidelines or principles in which we think should be adhered to or considered when working with Indigenous peoples. And it was developed by Indigenous peoples for Indigenous peoples. So I think that would be the best place, one of the best, a really good place to start when considering how to go about working with Indigenous peoples. Um, 
I might just get Kipper to jump back in really quickly and talk about our upcoming sessions following on from this at next year's 2018 I, I, I'm still around. Okay, so while Kipper's coming in, this um, session here is a follow-on of the Ashigan um, exchange from the previous year. Uh, Kipper is one of the chairs alongside um, Mark Dunn and uh, Philippe Hanna. So, okay, there you go. Um, was it? So if you enjoyed our presentation today and if you are wanting to see other uh, very practical applications or impact assessment examples with Indigenous peoples, I would very much urge you to attend uh, this session if you are coming to the II 2018. And keep it talking about this one. Okay. Kia ora, Tuminako. Um, so, yeah, I think Tuminako has already explained uh, the previous session, Ashikam one year on. We also have a, a session that we're co chairing uh, called Informing Enviro Cultural Justice and Impact Assessment. And what we'll be focusing on here, we're hoping, is through the papers submitted uh, to look at how the theme of the conference, cultural justice, enviro cultural justice, can be. Um, can be empowered within uh, projects, within development projects and other assessments. So that's uh, pretty much where things are at. We also have an idea that we may deliver a, um, a, pre, -post, a pre or a post conference event at some point. And so if you do have an interest in that uh, a one day workshop, by all means give us some uh, feedback in that regard. From here, I think we're going to questions. Uh, so kia ora tato. Okay. Well, we do have a few questions that came through. Um, thank you both for your presentations there. Um, this first one goes back to earlier part of your presentation, Keppa. Did economic did the economic element of Maori exist before contact with settlers? Okay. So thanks for the question, Peter. Um, I think first, just just understanding what economic is, uh, because we have a community understanding of uh, economy. Economic, economic comes from a couple of Greek words. I don't remember them. Uh, I did Latin back in high school, but um, they mean in combination managing your household for the best well-being of the occupants. So that's actually what economic is. So the question did. Um, did an economic aspect exist prior to the settler uh, government situation? Yes, it did. In fact, Firth did his PhD thesis about 100 years ago. Uh, it was published in 1929, so maybe not quite 100 years. But he identified in that thesis that Modi was the basis of the Maori economy. And what becomes evident when you're using this framework is that that means the long-term survival, sustainability, and flourishing was more important in a cumulative sense across all of the dimensions than the individual accumulation of, of um, monetary wealth, which I think has become a, a stronger determinant in today's society. So yes, it did exist, and um, it, but it was it wasn't maybe prioritised to the same degree, the way we're understanding it today. Okay. Um, Kathleen is asking, uh, she mentions that there's numerous situations where the values of the proponent are diametrically opposed to the values of indigenous people, and the project goes ahead with very little attention to the competing values held by indigenous peoples. Uh, what strategies do you use in those situations? Okay, well maybe Tuminak and I have a, have a, um, a tag team approach, but I'll just say that in terms of where diametric opposition of values exists, uh, I think the Agat's water supply example that, that I very, very briefly touched on at the end of my presentation, that, that showed exactly that situation. Um, how do we get through that type of situation? Well, I think the Modi model 
when it's implemented, you can separate stakeholder groups or participant groups that are diametrically opposed and get them to do the worldview prioritization separately. Um, once they have that prioritization, you then bring them back together and ask them to explain to the remainder of the group, you might have multiple stakeholder groups, what their priorities are. Now, through explaining what your priorities are, you're forced to identify what's important to you and also acknowledge that what isn't important to you, you probably don't know that much about. So in that way, there's a conceding that one voice doesn't actually have authority and um, total understanding. And that's probably the first point to getting a bit of compromise um, in terms of where you head. So clearly describing what a situation represents from different worldviews is very useful in that um, it can resolve the win-loss polarization that's created around a lot of development projects. And I'll, I'll just add to that a little bit. Uh, some of the workshops in which we have done, uh, more so Kip, Kip has done a lot more than I, but in some of the workshops that we have done, where this has been the case where there are essentially polar opposite views and the different stakeholders have both been in the room and both had an opportunity to uh, use or, or do their worldview quantification, uh, it provides a grounds or a means by which the other stakeholders can then uh, gain an appreciation of why the other side holds a particular um, holds a particular stance and although it, it probably most likely won't change our own stance we, we've found that just that opening the dialogue or opening that little bit of you know ex expanding your own or their own worldview a little bit by seeing what the other um, experiences or things within their own worldview uh, has been enough to at least you know open the little bit of the dialogue to get things started or and to come towards a better compromise than would have been possible uh, just at the start. Great, uh, Erica wants to know how do you quantify indicators that are spiritual or metaphysical? Okay, the uh, yeah the million dollar question. So what happens with spiritual indicators, um, the first thing is to understand what Modi represents in terms of a spiritual concern. Some, uh, some situations might be associated with a, um, a site, a particular location where an event has occurred and um, because of that event there are spiritual considerations to be kept in mind. So the way we would deal with a, a particular location is we would look at what that uh, historic event created in terms of a modi that's associated with that site. And that modi, that life supporting capacity or otherwise that's associated with that historic event is something that can impact upon the modi of individuals should they enter that site or um, it could an impact on the modi of other things. But what is important in terms of managing a significant site like that is that the modi that's been created is not denigrated or diminished because that is the actual offence that's created. Um, you might see the physical bulldozing of, um, of uh, archaeological remains. That, that's sort of a visual, but the, the spiritual um, integration is quite different and I think Tuminakal covered that quite well when he talked about the wreck being on the the um, Otaiti Seamount being like rubbish on your ancestor's coffin. Others referred to it as a scab on the head of the ancestor. Um, so you know these are very powerful ways of understanding it that from a um, a perspective that doesn't incorporate spiritual uh, perspectives can be difficult. But back to the question, how do you measure those? Well, in some cases, the thresholds, and I'll move to another example. We use water a lot for, um, for removing uh, tapu or sacredness. And that water that we use for that has to come from a particular place. 
And I think the Vatican has water like that too, so maybe they've got a similar way of understanding things. But our waters uh, come from particular springs. Now the expert that does those uh, lifting of sacredness, they must be confident that the integrity of that water and its source is adequate to achieve the purpose that they're trying to achieve. So if that source has been impacted or denigrated in terms of its modi, then the water available from that place is also denigrated and it may no longer be useful for the purpose it used to be. Now what does that mean in terms of thresholds? If the expert considers that water to be of um, the use that it's required to be, then it's a plus two. Anything else where they deem it to be unacceptable, you have a minus two. So those are your two thresholds in, in regard to that particular example. Um, the earlier example where you have a sacred site, then um, you know the, the Modi can be denigrated at that place, and I think you would have um, an understanding of um, what sits in the zero range around the site. But for something like a process or a practice that uses um, something that has to have its integrity, then um, it can be quite absolute as just a plus two or a minus two in terms of how it's scored. So this isn't something we can do over a webinar. It's um, something you need to do with the people to whom the spiritual values are important because they're the ones that should be identifying what the thresholds are and how they're interpreted. Okay. Anything to add to Monaco? No. Not on that okay. part. All right, Peter asks, how are trade-offs handled in the Maori model? Okay, um, well I think in a simple answer, the trade-offs are made transparent. As a decision reflects a particular bias or worldview. So once you have the model of what you're talking about, um, when the decision is made, you can reverse engineer the bias that led to that decision being made. So trade-offs are, are there, possibly, but what happens is they're made transparent. The other thing is that we're um, clearly, uh, there are trade-offs that represent an injustice, then it is more difficult to get away with doing it and people not really understanding what's going on. So the Modi model makes those trade-offs transparent, but it also provides a big incentive to uh, fully address the um, negatives that are being created and not try and brush over them because they may not be important to a particular worldview. Okay. Um, Daniel asks if uh, Hofstede's work helped develop your model and what were its key limitations? No, well, I'm not aware of Hofstede's work, so I can't comment on that. Timonaco? No. Okay. Neither, sorry. All right. Um, Jillian asks about the reference in the Whistler 2020. What was the reference to Whistler 2020 in your presentation, Kappa? Okay, so Whistler 2020 was one of the 11 um, sustainability indicator sets that the Cawthorn Institute looked at uh, across the world. This is a uh, sustainability indicator set, as I understand it, that was created by the Canadian municipalities in Whistler, and it's a way of assessing their progress towards sustainability. I'm, I'm not an expert on this model. It did achieve all of the uh, Bellagio stamp principles. However, in the report, Cawthron mentioned that it was the indicators were, were specific to the Canadian context and could not be readily transferred into other applications outside Canada, as I understand it. So that's what the reference was to Whistler 2020. Okay. Um, Donna wonders if, uh, if your research covers the topic of women's roles in Maori. And broader to that, is there any emphasis or encouragement for indigenous women to participate in the impact assessment? Um, I might take this one. Um, within our within this specific research, um, no, it, it didn't address the uh, topic of women's roles in Māori. Um, however, funnily enough, our main contacts or people that we have worked with with Te Aroa were 
mainly mainly very strong wahine to or very strong uh, Maori women who were leading the efforts for for their iwi, and it's not very uncommon within um, I guess Maori society and especially Maori research. We have a lot of we have a strong uh, female presence within Maori academia and especially and within I guess within tribal affairs. But there wasn't a, a specific focus for our research. No, it was a, just a, a very much broadly tribal tribal based. And if you have anything to say to that, Kepa. Um, well, I, I think the the idea of empowering indigenous voices also uh, is a similar uh, challenge to empowering um, voices from other perspectives. So I don't know why it wouldn't be effective at um, bringing all of those voices forward. Okay. Uh, Dan says, great presentation and research. Was there any attempt to quantify the economic impact of the arena disaster using ecosystem and cultural services valuation? And if so, how did this go? You first, to Minako, then. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, no, not at all. Uh, again, that comes back to, I guess, Kipper's earlier point about um, Attempting to quantify things in terms of, I guess, monetary or economic terms uh, within this particular context, uh, uh, we felt that the money model more than adequately uh, provided, you know, the, a, a suitable metric, uh, a framework to adequately cover not only just you know, environmental or or uh, cultural concepts, but also uh, an even broader holistic sense in terms of including these the community and the economic effects um, or economic um, concerns also but I can yep uh, all yours Kip. okay so so one of the issues with um, well one of the benefits of using the Modi model is that it shifts the basis for understanding away from a particular power structure and um, using Modi as the evaluation basis means that you have a measurement approach that's quite universal. Now with ecosystem services, and I've, I've used it only briefly, um, the two issues that come up for me is the first one is it tries to monetize impacts in terms of how I've been shown to use it and money isn't really a very good way of measuring a lot of things because it's very subjective and the subjectivity exists in two ways. Um, we don't all have the same amount of money uh, so the affordability um, of having particular outcomes is really determined by socioeconomic um, class structures that are outside the power of a lot of people. The second point around ecosystem services is it's incredibly subjective in terms of how you structure your questions. And the answer you'll get to the same question is very different depending on whether I ask you how much you're willing to pay um, to be able to see the beach the way it is today, tomorrow. If I structure the question as how much do I have to pay you not to see the beach the way it is today, tomorrow, you're going to give me a different answer. In the first one, you're limited by your own economic constraints. In the second one, you're not limited at all. So depending on how important that is to you, I'm going to have to pay for it. And the problem with ecosystem services is it doesn't make that differentiation. Uh, I think um, that's probably the reason that we didn't use it. Okay. Uh, to Monaco, uh, Catherine asks if the Maori model was developed after the spill or if it was available to help guide the response to the spill. Uh, no, so if the model was actually developed in response to an earlier, uh, so earlier problem, I guess you could say, which Kipper briefly touched on, so it was developed in around 2003, so it was available at the time of the disaster. Uh, and officially, we were on board, or Kippa had been invited to present and provide a unified response from from all the iwi, from all the, all the different tribal groups, from all the different areas, uh, to present a unified response to the disaster. However, only looking at the cultural aspect. So initially, we met with 
representatives from these different regions. We presented um, our research, uh, and people, everyone was on board, everyone was good to go. Uh, however, when we came back and said, no, we're not only going to just look at the cultural aspects, we, we're going to look at the, at the disaster and assess the impacts as a whole, uh, that wasn't taken very well by the funders, by the our government funders, and so uh, there are several different small, smaller ploys that were made, and funding was taken away, uh, and it was kind of made difficult for us from then on to conduct our research. And then we Kippa had to go out and uh, get independent funding outside of what we were initially. Uh, thought we could get, and in order to do this research. Okay. Um, another question for uh, Tumanako from Maria. Uh, what should have been done to raise the cultural dimension up to the baseline to meet the RENA recovery plan? Okay, so in, in terms of what can be done to, I guess, increase that baseline, a lot of the things, you know, are, are very simple. Uh, a very simple things that actually aren't physical in terms of things like recognition of the event or recognition of indigenous rights to this resource, to this reef, and recognition of rights to manage the reef because at the moment it's it's still not 100% sure in terms of who actually manages the reef, who uh, manages the resources. Uh, and these were uh, these lines or weren't at, weren't at all um, recognized within the official response, I think. Uh, one example of that was uh, it took, I think, two years before anyone outside of the res response team were able to have access to the reef itself. Now, that, that might, that seems logical, but from a cultural perspective, a big, a huge disaster has just happened. So, uh, from our from our cultural background, that reef is and that whole area is now under a status of tapu or sacredness. And in order for us to move on, there needs to be certain rituals and things that have to happen at the site. But because people weren't able to have access to the actual reef itself, uh, there was. A bit of a stasis. People were in limbo um, spiritually because the required rituals weren't able to go on. So after two years, we were given access to the site, uh, keep a child of a boat, and we were able to uh, uh, ferry a whole lot of people, a whole lot of the, the different tribal groups or representatives to the site, and we were able to conduct the necessary rituals for us to move past that initial phase of tapu. Uh, and a lot of it is, like, to answer the question, a lot of it is, is just around recognition of these traditional rights uh, and recognition in terms of the governance of the resources. Okay, thank you. Well, we still have questions coming in, but unfortunately that brings us to the end of our time. Uh, Tumako and Keppa have agreed to try and answer what they can um, that we didn't get to in terms of questions offline. Um, but thank you, Keppa and Tumanako, for your presentations today. Thank you all for participating in this webinar. Uh, if you are interested in attending IAIA, uh, you can visit our website at iai.com to go to IAIA 18 in Durban, South Africa. Um, to find out more about that conference, the program is online. Uh, and you can watch for news about our upcoming webinar, and that will be in February on health and gender impacts um, in a nighttime economy. So that will be our next webinar. As you leave today, you will be asked to complete a brief survey to give us some feedback, and so please take just a few quick moments to do that. We really do appreciate your feedback. We know that your time is valuable, and we hope you found this to be valuable as well. See you next time. Kia ora. Kia ora.